I've been a medical device company, software companies, and now I'm at a biotech company. Uh, so a lot of the strategy things cross industry lines. The other thing that I was involved with, um, this goes back a number of years, I, three of my buddies and I formed a company. It was a small medical device company that we started, ran it for about seven years, and uh, we didn't do very well at it. The business plan didn't get accomplished as we thought, and we ended up selling the assets of the company. So, life and business has, has its ups and downs, and I've been involved in both. I think you learn as much from the struggles and failures as you do from the good times. I've been in companies, was with one company where um, my job when I came in was to keep enough cash coming in to keep the company alive and to do a deal to help the company survive. And we get to Friday and not have enough money for payroll. And, um, I think you learn a lot in those situations, but I'm not sure I want to make a career out of living on, on the edge. So I've, and I've been in some very successful companies. I've been involved in an IPO that was quite successful, which very few people get to do, you know, traveling the world selling the stock. So anyway, that's my background. Uh, the company I'm with is called Techie Corporation. Uh, it's primarily a biotech company. And what we do is we manufacture in the laboratory proteins and antibodies. The proteins and antibodies that are fundamental to our bodies. And those products are used by researchers. They could be pharmaceutical, <coughs> biotech, or maybe academic researchers to do their studies. And what these researchers are doing is they're trying to figure out how cells, or why cells grow, or why they die, how they communicate with each other, or even internally within the cell. And they use our products to figure that out. What they're trying to do is understand disease better, uh, and maybe to find a cure or a solution to whatever the problem is. So we sell the raw materials that are used in that research. And it's a kind of a weird business. It's highly scientific. It's very complex. Uh, we have 650 people in the Twin Cities, of which 130 of them are PhDs from literally around the world. Some extremely bright scientists. And that's the crux of the company. Um, I'm going to take you back a year and how I got to Tech, or maybe more than a year. Uh, Technic was a client of mine back in the late 80s and early 90s. I was involved with a company with about $10 million in sales. The company is now over $300 million. And I got a call about nine years ago in the fall asking if I wanted to come there to be their first CFO. And they had one officer, uh, chief executive officer, with no backup. And he was getting pressure because he had no backup. The investors wanted another voice to talk to, and the auditors did not like that he was signing his own checks. So I came in, and the two of us were the only officers. Uh, in the nine years hence, the company's doubled in size, it's doubled in value. And what happened last November 1st or thereabouts is he was 72, and the board went to him and said, we're going to go outside and look for your replacement. He got upset and left. And so suddenly I was the only officer in the company that is over 300 million in sales, has a $3 billion value, uh, basically 1,000 employees worldwide. And I had to, uh, it's CFO, CEO, chief, whatever. And I had to have a strategy on how to handle that during the interim period. And then what has happened is a new, CF, a new CEO was named in April. And then we developed this plan that we publicly announced in September. And then for the last four weeks, I've been in triple week, five cities, I met with 80 different investors, and I was telling the market, literally trillions of dollars of investment funds. Uh, we are at one company this week in San Francisco, one firm that manages $1.2 trillion. So I mean, you're talking just astronomical uh, amounts of money that uh, I've been meeting with over the last few weeks to talk about the strategy. So that's the background of how we got to where we are. And I assume they've had a chance to look at uh, our strategy. And I don't know if you want me to talk about that or if you want to throw me with questions, whatever you'd like to do. Quiet group. Well, maybe first of all, um, you know, this was uh, in, in September you had done this call. What was the purpose behind doing it? Well, the purpose behind it was we had a new leader that was taking over. And the investors really wanted to know, what is your goals? What are you going to do? What's the plan? Should we invest? Should we not invest? Should we buy? Should we sell? The reality in any business is um, you have owners, and you're accountable, and they want a return on that investment. 
And those investors aren't just uh, investing in tech. Maybe. They aren't just investing in biotech, but should they invest in us or Google or General Motors or where should they put their, their money? And they want to return on that money for a reasonable amount of risk. They want to know why they should invest in tech. Now my job is to increase shareholder value. I mean, that, that's my job. And shareholder value gets measured every day. I can pull it up on my phone now and tell you what the value of the company is. People are judging our performance every sing every minute of every single day by buying or selling. And so we have an obligation to go to the shareholders, to talk to them at the same time. And it could be current shareholders or prospective shareholders. And say, here is what we are going to do. And I think this slide illustrates maybe the, the crux of the story. It's one of the ending slides. But this company is the most profitable company in the state of Minnesota on a percentage basis. For every dollar we sell, we put almost 40 cents on the bottom line. We generate cash like you can't believe and we can't get rid of it fast enough. Um, it's a company that's got, a, we are the strongest brand name in the industry. You know, we've got high, very high quality products. The products don't come obsolete. Um, we've got a very solid balance sheet. We've got tremendous assets to work with. Two thirds of our, um, Assets are in cash. We've got almost $500 million of cash that we don't know what to do with. And so those investors want to know, how are you going to use that? How are you going to use this solid foundation and make that grow to entice us to invest? Why should we be interested in this story? And so what we went out with, as we said, we've got a strong foundation, and we're going to do these things, and that's going to grow the business and give you returns. That's the, the crux of the story. And so the strategy, then, it's a strategy we're around these five, what we call pillars. And this was actually a strategy we started developing last November 1st. Um, and then when the new person came in, we, you know, packaged it. Because we couldn't do it before he got there because in the interim period, they'd say, well, is this really going to be what's going to stick and last? So th that's the background on how we got there. <coughs> And it is an international business, as you can tell, that second pillar is, I mean, we're talking worldwide geographies. In fact, as soon as I got up here, I got a call with a question on Singapore and Hong Kong. You know, what are we going to do there, and how quickly can I <coughs> deal with an issue over there? So you're, you're dealing, we're dealing in a global marketplace. Um, I know on one of the slides there was a map um, with all the companies that you guys Yes, that one. Um, so how many companies, or how many countries, excuse me, are you guys currently like located in as of today? Our prime operation is in Minneapolis. We have a small sales office that we acquired in 2005 that's in San Francisco. Okay. They sell to just one small segment of our market that's very specialized sales force. We bought a company um, two years ago in Boston that's basically an R&D facility with 15 people. We just bought for 106 million, 104 million, or in that range, uh, a company outside of Boston that's got about 100 people. Our European operations are based uh, about an hour northwest of um, London. We have about 60, it's a sales marketing, marketing sales and customer service there. Two years ago, we bought, uh, they make small molecules, which probably means nothing. Most of you, but that's uh, just outside of London as well. So we've got two operations in Europe, and we've got an operation in China right now. That's primarily logistics. It's designed to, as marketing, sales, and support. So, long answer to your question: but three countries, U.S., U.K., China, and then in the U.S. we've got a handful of facilities. It's close to a thousand employees. But you're selling to. We sell throughout the world. But that's what this chart is. A little over half our sales are in the US. A little less than a third are in Europe. Pat Grimm would be, that's primarily Japan, Korea, Singapore, Thailand, Australia, and then China. China's such a huge market. You know, we've separated that out because we think there's great growth prospects there. And then the rest of the world's 5%, but the rest of the world is literally the rest of the world. I would say it's 
of that last 5% is primarily Eastern Europe and maybe a little bit South America. Um, yeah, so one of my questions was like, so uh, the strategy you're talking about, like global expansion, do you have like any upcoming countries you really want, you can you see an opportunity in where you really want to expand in, in the rest of the world, like your 5% that you really want to market to? Yes, uh, and we think the biggest piece is in China. I mean, because the market is just so huge. And we just came out of a class where we talked about market size and market capacity. It's really how big is the addressable market. I think China is really the place to go. We've got a dozen, 15 people there. We can't geographically cover China with 15 people. We can't cover Shanghai with 15 people. And it's, it's a very interesting market because um, Beijing is primarily governmental and academic, and we sell to those arenas where Shanghai is more industrial, commercial, biotech, and pharma companies. But we're located in Shanghai. Uh, the expansion um, strategy is to put more people in both places, both their ends, have people actually on the ground in Beijing. And then the other strategy is to use distributors to cover the rest of the geography and, and really manage the distributors to get basically partners to help sell in China. The issue you know, as you go back to the prior slide, we've got content. We've got 2,400 or 24,000 products that we can sell. So we've got the content. You know, the strategy there is more delivery. How do you get these products to the market? How can you capitalize on the market? So then, the other thing is, um, we'd like to go more into the Pacific Rim. So that's primarily Japan, Korea, Singapore, those areas. And we've been trying to manage those countries from Minneapolis, and there are cultural differences, there's legal differences, there's business practice differences. And so the strategy there was to hire somebody uh, who's an expert in Southeast Asia or Asia background, and to locate them there to try to beef that up and build basically a, an Asian uh, operation that can serve Asian customers. So those are primarily the two pieces which is depicted on this slide and then on this slide. The other piece that we, we've really thought about is what we call China for China. Um, we manufacture pretty much everything in Minneapolis. And we've got know-how and expertise that we really don't want to transfer to China. And by the time you take a product from Minneapolis into China, you've got to pay duties, taxes, products become much more expensive and it's difficult to compete. So what we're looking at is, can we get a different brand that has maybe a, what we call it, a lower quality, lower image, lower cost, lower value proposition, have that actually manufacture those products in China to sell in China, so you don't go through the extra cost of importing them into China. And then you, you've got a brand distinction in a larger market. So those are the you asked a very simple question, what are we trying to do in Asia? It's multiple things. Expand the selling in China, probably do something with manufacturing in China and expand delivery of content throughout the back room. Mary, would you be able to provide the backstory? Because we've been spending a lot of this, the first part of our uh, <coughs> semester talking about external analysis and internal analysis, <coughs> like internal capabilities. Um, and how you got to that decision of it's China, it's the Pacific Rim, you know, we're, what were some of the things that you did within your organization and partners to come up with the, the info or intelligence to say, this is the direction that we think is best? Well, it was, it's really, where are your markets? And what are the addressable markets? And you know, you can look at them geographically, and that's what we're really talking about here. But the markets are very different in the US, in Europe, in China, and in the rest of the world. Um, the issue with the US is a lot of about a third of our U.S. customers um, are academic, so they're funded by grants. So these are the big research universities, you know, the Harvards, the Stanfords, and so forth. Those academia, or in academia, they're, they're funded by uh, government grants. Well, guess what? Government grants, through because of sequestration, were cut 8 to 10 percent. Um, you know, the government's been shut down for a couple weeks. You know, the, the grant money is just not there. Our, our academic business is actually declining in the U.S. So the question is, do you invest there or not? 
and or do you invest in China in the PAC rim where there's more funding available where there's part of their national strategy in China is to fund research. The other, so we've got a declining academic market in the U.S. We've got an uncertain economy in Europe and because of labor laws and business practices in Europe, a lot of companies have shut down their operations to Asia and China specifically. So we have two of our primary markets, and I have to go back to that slide, but you know, we have, what, 85% of our business is in Europe and the U.S., and those are declining or flat markets. And the growing market is where we've got 14%. So you kind of say, where's the market, where's the money, where can we actually grow the business, and where should we be investing our resources, and that's how we got it. That's why China and um, the PAC are so important. You have written a few MAs when you're going through the history of the company, and there were a few more highlighted in the slides themselves. And I think in the call they were referred to as kind of bolt-on MAs. So I was just wondering how you determined what companies to buy and kind of the process of bridging them together. But I had a slide in there. We've added one that shows the, the history of the company and um, how we got to where we are. Um, we call them tuck in or bolt in acquisitions because they aren't transformational. They aren't, they aren't, they're, they aren't big enough to really move the needle a lot. You know, you're talking, the one we just did is going to add 10% to our sales. I'm giving you wrong numbers. So it's not like you're dramatically changing the company, but the one we just did in July uh, was a complementary product line in a business that now we've got more critical mass. So, when we talk about Bolton acquisitions, they're, they're smaller deals where you aren't, if you're betting a lot of resources, you can afford to make a mistake, but they're important to strengthen the business. So that's what we talk about tucking or Bolton, that's what we're talking about. As compared to like if you did a billion dollar acquisition where you totally changed the nature of the company, which is a lot more risk. It's a lot more risk. So we've been very cautious historically and we've done every few years one of these bolt-on type things that have broadened the product set or strengthened the business, but not taking on a lot of risk. Now your question is how do we get there? We look at probably three or four things. And I'll tell you, there's probably two business development or acquisition opportunities that came in today while I've been up here. And we try to process them and pick which are worthy of looking at and which aren't very quickly so that we don't spend a lot of time on it. But the first um, thing we do is we spend a lot of time saying where is the product fit? How adjacent is, is it to what we know? Um, does it increase our product offering? Does it increase our geography? What would we learn from doing it? The bottom line on that phase of analysis is what does it do strategically to improve the business? And if we don't know about it, you know, we aren't going to go sell tires or something. You know, we just aren't going to go there. But we spend a lot of time looking at the markets, looking at what it brings us, looking at the product set. And I would say that, you know, I don't know what the number is, 80, 90% of the opportunities get disqualified just based on that. We get scientists involved in it, business development people. Um, you, know, you look at are the markets growing or shrinking? Uh, what can we do with this? Does it fit into our distribution? Um, there's just a myriad of things we look at to make sure there's a good scientific and product and geography fit. But that's the first cut before we even get to economics. And you, know, you, you think they're economic deals all the time, but we never get to the economics until we get past that first piece. So, but then we move to the economics, and there's some basic fundamentals we look at. Um, the first thing is there's, I don't know if you got into cost of capital, but there's a cost to the capital that you've got, and that's, you know, we don't have any debt, but debt's cheaper than stock. You know, if you have shares, you know, investors that invest it, put their equity, expect higher returns. But our average cost of capital is about 8%. We generate about a, just in round numbers, a 15%, say, 16% return on our capital. So if it's costing us eight, and we're returning 15, we're adding 7% of value every, every year. 
And that's how we look at that. So when we evaluate an acquisition, we say, what kind of return on our investment are we going to get? And ideally, we'd like that to be above the 16% the we're getting now, because if we get a return that's greater than that, we'll improve the overall return on investment for the company. So we're always looking at what the cost of capital is versus the return we're going to get. And frankly, it's very easy to make something accretive. Accretive means you're, you're adding value. But right now, on this 500 million in cash that we have, we're running like 0.75%. So if we get a 15% return, you know, it's a much, much better deal. But it, it all has to do with value creation. And um, so we look at, we'd like it to be, whatever we're getting into, be growing faster than our average growth rate, because if we do that, we increase the, the growth rate. And if we can add value, above the cost of capital, above our average return on equity, that'd be great. Now, sometimes you might invest and not get the returns early on if the returns are real big and the risk is low going forward. But, so again, first we look at the scientific value it adds, what it adds to the product set, what it does for us strategically, then we get into the economics. The third piece is then, is there a cultural fit? Can we run this business effectively? And maybe related to that, it's maybe the third, fourth are combined, but not only culture, but can we execute and really make something out of this? And if we don't think we're aligned or we can run it, or you know, maybe it's in a country or an area where we don't understand the business practices, we, we, we won't do it. So there's really three or four levels that we go through. Greg, in a generic way, I'm sorry. Um, no, maybe, you can go. Oh, go ahead. Well, no, you can go. No, I was just going to build on that question. Um, but maybe you have the same one. If maybe you could give us just a set, a generic example where it may have seemed like it fit, but there was something that came up that you just said, um, just to, to kind of build out that any of those four concepts. Well, I think what we get a lot is because we've got so much cash, we have a lot of people that call in. And there's a lot of, let me call them startup ventures that say, you know, we need three million, five million. It's not a big deal to you. Uh, we could add to your products that it would be a great deal. Well, we're not a bank. And what happens where they get disqualified at that level is if we make a $3 million investment or $5 million investment, it takes as much time as the $100 million investment does. And it, it, it's not going to be big enough to move the growth rate to really uh, dramatically improve the rate of return. And it's probably just not worth doing. So a lot of them get disqualified just based on size. I mean, I think that'd be a real good example because we get a lot of those. And you kind of go, if, if it's not going to make a difference and it's going to absorb a lot of my time, a lot of our, our not my time, but you know, our time, uh, you know, it's, it's just probably not worth doing. So, you know, the $10 million acquisitions we did five years ago are now, you know, we did a couple of deals that are in the $100 million range. It's, it's ratcheting. It's not to say we won't do a small one, you know, if the risk is right, and again, going back to the criteria I talked about, but, you know, it's really got to make a difference somehow or we won't do it. So we get a lot of those that talk, get tossed out. Well, first I was just wondering who your top competitors are and how much you guys are looking at your competitors that arrive, arrive. and also because this is such a specified, a specialized market, is there High interest to barriers, high high entry barriers uh, for new companies, or how does that work? That's a lot of questions. Yeah. So let, let me see if I can get them all. We base these are the product sets we sell, and uh, this is about seventeen percent of the business here. The rest of these are eighty-three percent of the business. Okay, I'm just trying to give you some mm -hmm. dimension, and. The way this works, the product set works, is if you make a protein, every protein that you make, or we make, spawns four to ten other products. So if you make a protein, you might get two or three antibodies in a kit, and you know, there's a multiplying effect. So you need really good, high quality proteins. Um, so the first question I'd like to answer that was embedded in yours is, who are the competitors? They're different in each of these three, and, and they're, they're different competitors. We are probably the market leader in proteins. 
They're very difficult to make, they're very fickle, and this goes to one of your other questions. Yet, you can make one pretty easily. It's a string of amino acids that you can put together, but they're geometrically shaped. And it's like, if you took a string of beads, it'd be very easy to put a string of beads together, but if you put them in your pocket, what would happen? They get all tangled and touch each other. And that impacts the reactivity, the purity, and it, it just takes a lot of know-how. It, it's really interesting to watch these scientists because it's almost like a, I'll give you another analogy, a master chef. I could, if I got the recipe and a master chef got the recipe, I'll guarantee you whose was going to be better because they'd add a pinch of salt and a dash of sugar and, you know, it's all this know-how to make the meal, you know, really special where I wouldn't know how to do that. That's what proteins are, are like. They're very difficult and the know-how is very difficult and that's why we're the market leader. Our next biggest competitor is a private company called Epitec. They pretty much, every time we introduce a product, they make the same product and follow us. But we've got 30 years of history of very high quality, and we've got the same people making them, and it's the know-how that's. So this is very different, but as you can see here, it's got a slower growth rate, it's a smaller market. We need this to get to these. Next comes the antibodies. And the antibodies, there are thousands of uh, one of our directors said, "Any, but my grandmother can make an antibody. And the way you get an antibody is you take the protein and you immunize an animal. It could be a mouse, a donkey, a goat, a sheep. And what happens is, just like when you get a cold or something, there's something foreign in your body, and your body produces antibodies against whatever the bug is that's in you. But that's how the animals react also. And so, like, we use a lot of sheep and goat. You take a blood draw like this, you, you purify it, you get an antibody. So it's very easy to make antibodies. There's literally thousands of antibody competitors. And then there's a number of companies that, it's almost like Amazon.com, that will sell, buy our antibodies and resell them. So they're, they're just, they aggregate from a whole bunch of um, different suppliers with no regard to quality, and they just sell everything. So it's a highly competitive space, very broad market. And anybody can start, put up a website and say, I've got antibody to sell. What we offer, though, is if somebody's got a problem with the antibody, they can actually get down to the scientist who worked on it and made it. So we've got a quality advantage and an access advantage, a customer service advantage, but that's narrowing because it's very easy to make antibody. Somebody can buy our proteins and immunize an animal, make a protein, and sell it against us. Immunoassay kits are very complex, a lot like the proteins. And those competitors, there are usually subsidiaries of bigger multinational companies. They're very hard to make. And what an immunoassay kit is, I'm going to draw another analogy. I assume not, anybody a biology major in here? <laughs> uh, so that's why I'm giving you these. Simple examples, just so you can maybe have an image of what they're like. A, a kit is basically a pre-prepared uh, kit for an experiment. And the analogy I'd like to draw is a TV dinner. I could go out tonight and buy meat, potatoes, vegetables, fruit, and spend a lot of time making a dinner. And the dinner that I make today is going to be a different quality than the dinner I make tomorrow. Every day is going to be different, right? And it takes time. I could, if I, for a reasonable price, could buy a, a say, TV dinner, pre-prepared frozen dinner, that is of reasonable quality to meet my objectives, it's, <coughs> it's worth my time because I know it's going to be the same every day for a reasonable price. That's what these kits are. It's a combination of proteins and antibodies put together to make a kit, to make it easier for somebody to pull it off the shelf and do an experiment. But to do that, you've got to have good components. And you've got to know what works. And so that, takes a lot more work. So the competitors here are different, it's a different market. So I think that answers the first part of your question. I already forgot what the last part was. Well, I just thought that, is there like high entry barriers? Well, the entry barriers are the know-how. Okay. And that's why the entry barriers and antibodies are much lower than, you know, the other products. So, you know, this gets back to understanding your markets. Um, we were talking earlier today you know, we talked, we started this conversation by looking at geographic markets, you know, so strategies relative to geography. But then you look at product sets. You know, the, the 
each of these are a different market for a different purpose, a different know-how. And you really have to understand each of those markets as well. And that's why there are different strategies around each of these. So you guys had your uh, global strategic vision <coughs> conference about a month ago. And then how did, how is that uh, your strategy from what you presented about a month ago? How has that changed since last year with like influence of Wall Street and well, it's not, expectations? You know, I, I gave the background of the company and the, the guy that was leading the company for 30 years came in as a consultant in around 1980, early 80s. And the company was on the brink of bankruptcy. And he was brought in as a consultant to see if the company should be saved or not saved. And he thought it should be saved. And they didn't have any money to pay him, so they paid him a stock. And when he left, that stock was worth $125 million. So he made a good bet, right? But his strategy, and you know, he's a very conservative guy, and he believed that conservatism and predictability were important. And that had a lot to do with how he was brought up and experiences that he had in his lifetime. And he believed that if we would put out new products, and they, they would be, a, the strategy really was if we put out new products that were of high quality, that we could grow at or faster than the market and generate a lot of cash and add a lot of value. That was the strategy going in. The problem was there's a supply and demand side to a business. We could provide the supply, if you will, the products. But if the demand, as I talked about earlier, was weakening in the US and the academic markets and was unstable in Europe, we were relatively flat for the last three years. And so I think what happened is the board said, OK, you're 72 years old. It's time to make a change. You know, we need more energy. We need to grow the business. You know, that's what, we've got to use those assets. Remember that column I showed you earlier? We need to use those assets to grow the business faster to enhance the return. And that's where the change in strategy came from. So with the new leader coming in, then we needed to fulfill that obligation. And the investor community was waiting. They, they knew one thing. They invested in one thing. They were comfortable with one thing for 30 years. But now that changed. And so what does that mean? So we had an obligation to go and say, this is how it's going to change. I think that that's a really great analogy. We've been talking about agency theory versus stakeholder theory. You know, here it was significantly <coughs> driven by shareholder expectations that they want the return um, to be enhanced. Well, but it's, it's also a different kind of investor, and I think you know, one of the concerns I have with all of this is we have had a very stable, patient, really high quality group of investors for years. I mean, they are some of the biggest names you, you've heard of, biggest funds, and they don't care about the quarterly results. They get a nice dividend, they know over time that this is going to be consistent, it's predictable, it's low risk. It, it's almost like a quasi bond that they were investing in. The issue now with the strategy is the risk-reward scenario is probably, probably a lot wider. We were in a risk-reward scenario that was like this. So you may not have gotten the rocket-type growth, but it was pretty predictable and we generated a lot of cash. And it wasn't, may not have been the, all the upside, but there wasn't a lot of risk involved. If you look at this strategy, it's going to take a lot more investment to do it. And you're betting um, you know, a lot more money, if you will, so is that worth, is that risk worth taking to get growth and will that lead to profitability? And I mean, it's a great strategy and I'm fully endorsing of it, but you know, there's, there's risk involved in, in all, in anything you try. And you know, will that pan out or not? So what that does, going back to investors, is it attracts a very different type of investor because the risk reward scenario is much wider. And so will that change? I, I mean, my guess is it's going to change the nature and type of investor that we have. And that's not good or bad, it's just it's, it's different. Throughout your career, it sounds like you've worked with a lot of um, medical device and companies similar to Technic. How have you married kind of your finance mind with kind of the PhD minds that you've been working with? I mean, you seem very well versed in the product and everything. Yeah, because none of your biology majors, if I had these PhDs in here, they'd be laughing at me. 
I've had to, I mean, one of the things I've had to do, I mean, this is a very complex business, and I've had to develop, the, you're talking about all elevator speeds, I've had to develop, and hopefully I did okay here today, a business to describe, a, a little speech, if you will, to describe the business to create interest in a very short period of time. I mean, I, mean, I, I could, you know, go through the science kind of behind it. It's intriguing, I mean, it's just really intriguing. But my job is to communicate a very complex science to an investment community that may or may not know. Now, I do deal with some PhDs and um, medical doctors that are also investors, but you know, in large part, I need to have credibility with a non-scientific uh, audience. So I really, what I did when I got there is I, I actually spent time in the labs. I ran test. I, I mean, I went through every department, every step along the way to try to learn the business so that I could try to explain this to the outside. And I work daily with, um, you know, various very bright scientists. And, uh, you know, after nine years, you should, you should pick up a little bit of this. But every business is different, and you really have to get into the crux, I think, of, of what adds value and what drives value. And it's, it's, it has nothing to do with financial statements. Actually, the financial statements are a very vanilla and very easy model to understand. I can explain that quite readily. But the science behind it is really what drives the value, and that's what the time needed to be spent. That's true in any business you go into. You just really have to understand what creates value. Oh, I was telling Margaret earlier, uh, one of the toughest things, I think, is the cultural aspects of running this business. We have 130 PhDs, and literally they are from around the world. You know, certainly we got US based and trained, born, raised, trained people. We've got a number of PhDs from China, Taiwan, France, Italy, Spain, uh, Russia. I mean, it is literally from around the world. And uh, if you walk through our operation, it really truly is the United Nations. And I think one of the more difficult things to deal with is all the various cultural aspects because every one of those nationalities has a different culture and a different way of doing business and they're very bright scientists that are are wed together for their love of science and you know a quest to help um, society understand disease and to help cure and that's what pulls them together and that's why they're there but their business sense their people skills they're, I mean it's, it's all culturally driven and that that's really a, I think a, a tough part of the business to, to really maximize value but it's an interesting very interesting. It's very um, stimulating and educating. Not many people have the chance to live in that kind of environment. One of your five pillars in your strategy was to retain and recruit um, top talent, essentially. And so, hearing a little bit about your um, the, the types of scientists that you have there, what type of activities does your um, company do to? find top talent, especially on a global level? Like, what's your strategy behind that? Well, a couple comments. Um, it's a lot easier now than it was back 10, 20, 30 years ago. When we only had a couple PhDs, it was difficult. Now with 130 of them, there's enough critical mass that they can consult with each other, that they've got support systems. You know, it's easier to attract and retain for that reason. Um, the other thing is, it, we're kind of a cross between academia. So you see, where do a PhD biologist work? And you know, they can work in academic, and in, in an academic environment, but what they, then they have to write a lot of papers, they've got to write a lot of grants, they spend a lot of time looking for grant money, uh, they've got to publish, and that's not necessarily fun for them. I asked one of, we had a really top-notch PhD guy who actually came up this sounds kind of strange, but he was one of the top 10 people in China in his graduating class, you know, that whatever year that was. And this pretty bright guy. I said, why are you here? He said, well, it's, it's really very stimulating to me because I get to develop a product that is used by scientists around the world, and they publish papers, and they say they use my product. And that's very, um, you know, it's kind of makes me feel really good. Their alternative then, if they don't go to academics or stay in academics, is they go to industry, but if they work at a big pharma company, they're working on one project for 
three, five, seven years, and it's very narrow. So they get the broadness. The, so it's, to answer your question, it's much easier now than it was, and there, there's reasons we like to be there, so that, that really helps attract scientific talent. The way we recruit scientific talent, we have a need, it's a worldwide search. And these people, because they're from all around the world, they've got people they want to postdoc with, and wrote papers with, and that they've been to conferences with, and so they can access, you know, any people in these networks, and, you know, that's how we go find the talent. Beyond um, the scientists, though, as you continue to evolve the business in this new way, where do you see other pockets of talent um, that will be required in order to do what needs to be? Well, I think that's where the real issue is. Um, you know, to answer your question, I think we've got the ability to track between scientists for the reason we outlined. But we were running the company with two corporate officers, and then for a good chunk of the last year, with one. And it's a pretty big company. I mean, that's not a sustainable model. You need broader talent. And as you can see by this slide, we had, a, frankly, a very weak head of sales and marketing. We made a replacement there and brought somebody with a lot of industry experience. The other piece, we had a um, chief technical officer. That's like the chief scientific officer. That's the first one on, on the slide. We had a guy uh, that was nearing retirement. We needed to replace him. So that was maybe an age and an energy. And we want somebody with broader context, not just internal context. So that replacement was me. But we had to, you know, we were operating the team with, like I said, two of us together that would spend hours together. And, you know, that's just, we ran with very lean overhead. And the whole concept, going back to your earlier question, the strategy was keep overhead, keep management very low, and it's all driven by the products and the science. And that's where we're going to put all the money. So we never had a true management team. So if you're going to take this from $300 million to a billion dollar company, it's probably not sustainable to operate with two officers. So you've got to build a management team. So that means sales marketing, business development, human resources, technical science, you know, finance and accounting. You know, you have to have all disciplines covered. And we're going from a model where we haven't had that to where we need to have that. And frankly, that's something that I, last November 1st, when I took over the center on role, the first thing I thought that would we need to do is build a management team. So I went and I took, you know, who's my top quality person, who's my top HR person, who's my top uh, IT person. We pulled together about an eight person management team. Started working together because my belief, if this is a strategy, thin strategy, I had a strategy for the interim period, was that that would probably sustain, be sustainable no matter who came in and we needed to start working on that. That actually, I think, paid dividends because we did have a management team before we started operating as one. So when this new person came in, at least he had something to start with. Where when I took over last November first, we really didn't. I lost my one buddy. Yeah, so we're starting kind of from scratch. So I, I think going back to the question of talent, outside of the top two positions that were replacement, we really need to build and strengthen the management team. And you need to build it for the future because. These five pillars aren't going anywhere if you don't have the person power and strength behind that to run the business. I mean, you have all the great theory in the world, but if you don't have, it goes back to execution, if you don't have the talent to execute it, you know, the plan's not going to work very well. I guess uh, you guys want to expand like, and extend more you know, like Brazil. How do you plan on doing that? Well, Brazil's not a very big market, and I, I think the concept behind that is we want to, but it's someplace we should be. And um, we were just at a, there's a, let's call it a trade show that was in Italy that happens every three years. We got just, a, I think, over a thousand leads, and like hundreds of them were from Brazil. So that indicated us that there's a market there. What we do is we'll have to find a partner in Brazil. I mean, it's not big enough to invest a lot. We don't know a lot about it, so we'll have to find a distributor, a series of distributors, and some of the South American options to do that. You're constantly faced with decisions on do you buy or do you build. So do you do it internally or do you do it externally? And that's a case where we're better off probably doing it externally. Do you have another question? Um, so with your global expansion, what are some of the 
I would say, like, uh, cultural or social issues or government issues that, you're, that you realize you're facing moving into these markets? Well, I tell you, it, going into China as an example, it took us well over a year to get the 25 government permits that we needed to just open a sales office there. And the, we had to handle that by having people that were experts in China, people that were partners in China, on the ground doing that. But there's a whole myriad of uh, regulation that, and it's, it's highly complex and you have to do it do it right or you get, uh, you know, it, it'll cost you more later on than it does to get the operation started. But I mean, when I got here this morning, I got a call from Singapore. You know, we want to hire somebody in Singapore and then you get into questions like, well, to hire somebody in Singapore, you need to have a business operating in Singapore be registered. Well, that means you've got to do statutory audits, you've got to file tax returns, you've got to, you know, do we have the capacity to do that? And are there better alternatives? You know, are there better returns on that investment? How big is the Singapore market? And, and so one simple question leads to a whole myriad of analysis that you have to do to make sure you get good value. And you don't want to make a decision that's going to cost you more later on to get out or to clean up than to go in. Because you can make a little quick decision, but a wrong decision for the long term. But every country is different. And you've got to understand the rules and where to go. Uh, you, you consult and you read and you, you deal with experts and cool the people that have been there. Uh, my question is about uh, when you step into the Chinese market, um, what is the biggest problem uh, me are facing? Um, I was going to say about the license problem because. I know if there is a lot of government license because uh, I'm from China, and I'm still thinking about like uh, what if your product get cut by others and what are you gonna um, do with those things? Well, we're, we're very concerned about what we call piracy, mm -hmm. and y y we talked earlier about the know-how, and I don't have a slide up what the product says, but you know we're really expert in what we do, and what we probably do or what we're thinking of doing is the only manufacturing we would do there would be on maybe some more lower level, less technical products that are more commodity-like, that are, are driven by costs more than anything. We won't take our highest uh, value products where we're unique and put those over there. So it's basically um, like um, reduce the uh, uh, quality of the product to like a Chinese market yes. um, level. And do you um, facing any problem about like um, uh, the like what you uh, when you have like about the cultural uh, differences like uh, to sell the sell techniques product to um, like a company or to a college university um, like those cultural um, problem. The cultural problems are probably much less than you might think on the surface. And it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. A lot of the people, the top researchers in China have been educated in the US and then go back. And so if you're really talking about the top research institutes, there's a, a global bond in science that crosses geographies. And a lot of our product, because people have come to the U.S. and studied, they've used our product in the U.S., so there's a, a value, perception of value to those scientists. So it's much easier um, to access those people than you might think because of their prominence in worldwide research and because they're studying in, in the U.S. But the market is so huge, there's also a lot of low, what we call lower level people not of the same prominence of the scientists we're talking about that are driven by price. And that's where you get into maybe a different quality of product, different price point of product for the Chinese market. And that's, so you, so you analyze that market, there's really two separate um, tranches within them that are very, very different. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Uh, how, how does it happen? with any in, uh, any uh, government in general, like in Russia or in China or anywhere in the world? Well, we don't need cash, so we're not really looking for investors. 
but in China we might have to go in a partnership of some type, you know, to, to get in there, and that becomes very difficult because it is very government controlled, and it's also regionally controlled. Um, I hope I'm saying this correctly. You're from China. I'm not. I've been there, but no, I was going by. Yeah. Uh, I see. But you know, the the govern the uh, mayors are, very, are almost like our governors. Mm -hmm. they, they carry a lot of prominence and get to maybe choose who their partners are and who the industry are. So we have to have relationships with people like that in order to be effective in China. Because if you don't have the support of the government, you know, it's very difficult to do business. So I mean, we've got to establish those relationships. And the person we have running our operation in China now actually has pretty strong political ties. Her mother was the head of the Center for Disease Control in China. And her father was a doctor, so I mean, there's some prominence in the family and that you know, she understands China and that, that helps. But you do have to get down to the mayor level and the government level and have relationships to be successful with. But one of the best ways to do it is to have people that have experience and recognition. You know, it's awfully hard for, I mean, there's no way I can show up in credibility. On one of the slides, uh, it was highlighted how you were going to quantify your progress with your strategy, and there were some traditional measures like revenue growth and return on investment capital. I was wondering if you could highlight the additional metrics that are listed there and kind of expand on those. Well, product vitality has to do with, um, as, you, as we introduce new products, what kind of return are you going to get on those products? So what we've committed to doing is measuring that, disclosing that. So if we introduce a thousand new products, how much revenue will they generate, and for how long? And so will be more prominent in that disclosure. We've done that kind of, but it's just going to be more prominent. And then, you know, we laid out this plan and some of the things we've done, but, you know, we've laid out the plan and there's a checklist, some which are done, some are not, so we'll be measured against that plan. And then the plan's going to be something that has to evolve over time as well. So, I mean, the way we run the business is, you know, going back to that other slide is, um, you know, is the sales growth accelerating? Are we improving returns on capital? Because that's how they get a return. And then those others are, are we making progress towards the strategy? And I think as you talk about measurements, you want to have measurements that are easily identifiable and measurable. And you don't want too many. But if you ask what really drives value, it's, you know, if, we, if we're going revenue faster than we have been historically, and if we're increasing the invest, return on invested capital, the shareholders get that. And then at the, then at the bottom to our, do they believe in the story? I mean, is this the right strategy that we're following? Um, this is a little preview of coming attractions because we're getting to innovation strategy next week. But one of the things that just struck me is how many new products you're introducing on an ongoing basis. And I was hoping you might be able to talk about, you know, what is that strategy that, and how do you fit that in with Well, the way we've historically done it is we've got all these PhDs and they talk to their cohorts, they go to trade shows, they read literature, and then they decide collectively which products we were going to go into. And they kind of come in family. I mean, there's uh, the WIMP family of proteins that deal with cancer. There's the interleukin that set up family. There's like 37, I think, interleukin products or proteins that deals with inflammation. So they come in families. And depending on what area of science was hot, that's how they chose what we're going to do. The issue is you, we're trying to stay ahead of science. And we're trying to develop products because if we wait for a scientist to come and say, I need this product, it's probably too late because it'll take us months, a year to develop the product. So we've got to, have, we've got to anticipate where the market is going and have product that they want. And so it's a guessing game. And out of those, if we introduce 1,500 a year, uh, some sell a lot, some don't sell at all, and then somebody will write a paper five years from now and this product will become hotter than this product, and, but they don't become obsolete. So we, it, we've really historically developed it on a pool basis, and just, I would say, throw it against the wall, but you mm -hmm. hope you guessed right. I mean, what we're trying to do strategically is gauge key opinion leaders, which are basically 
prominent scientists throughout the world, and you probably divide that into areas of you know, cancer versus cardiac versus inflammation or whatever the case is, and get different key opinion leaders that will help guide our people to say, just give them one more reference point so that we're making better choices in which products we develop. So that's how the strategies change. It's maybe a more focused um, choice of products because it's not necessarily the number but how many ultimately sell, and that's why you get back this mortality index. That's where that measurement comes from. You touched on, um, just looking at the implementation of your strategy, you touched on the point that you've been traveling a lot and speaking with shareholders and probably, I would assume, making sure that everyone's comfortable with and really understanding the strategy in a whole. But what other aspects of implementation will be happening within the next couple months or possibly even years, would you say? Like, what other components? Well, the meetings that I've had are, are really um, to reinforce the strategy presentation, and that's the whole investor side. The strategy implementation really is going to happen internally, and you know this is kind of the, the checklist. But there's various aspects. I mean, our HR people have to own this piece of this. They've got to have systems in place to track, retain, you know, evaluate talent we have. How do you keep them? What motivates them? Who are the rising stars? Who should you counsel about? You know, all those types of things. So they own this. Um, you know, this chief technology officer has to own the top one, and he's got a list of objectives. Um, you know, this is primarily China and the pack room person are responsible primarily for this. <coughs> and you've got a sales marketing is responsible for this. And then, you know, we all, as a management team, are probably responsible for this. But there's different ownership, but then it's just, that's the assignments, maybe. But we all have to be aligned as a management team, and then you get cross-functional things. Like, the call I got this morning came from uh, the person that's running the pack rim, and he had the question in Singapore, so I've got to work with him to answer that question. So you get a lot of cross-pollinization and cross-involvement, because no one person can do this alone. And every decision you make has impacts on everybody else. A decision down here on talent recruitment might impact you know, the quality and retention of scientists, and the needs in this area may cause them to recruit differently. So I mean, there's really got to be a marriage of different functions and disciplines. And that's why, going back to the comment, we need a management team that works together for this won't work. You can't do it with two people. So two people are okay if on um, this you know, conservative strategy we had before. So you guys have your two divisions um, going off your, your internal analysis here. Is one, are you guys shifting to, towards one more specific division of your, your hematology? Is that, is that like well, a backseat or? Well, it was a little bit of a backseat. You know, the his, back in the early 80s, it was totally a hematology company. And over time, that's gone from 100% hematology down to 7% hematology. And hematology grows in mid single digits. It just, it's highly profitable. You'd love to own that business by yourself. I mean, it's, it's a very good business, but it's not as profitable as the biotech business. The biotech business has gone from nothing to 93% of the business. So the question, and there's use of byproducts out of hematology and uh, biotech. So there's some synergies between the two divisions. So it's a division we want and want to keep. It's not like, it's a good business. But it was becoming too small, and so the strategy with this acquisition we did in July was to bring in a whole complementary product set of we call them clinical control products now for hematology products. And those deal with blood gas and blood sugar, where before we dealt with controls and calibrators for hematology instruments. But it's a same customer set, strengthens the um, product set, and it gives that division more critical mass, so it's more important. So that was kind of the strategic logic behind it, was the match of the product set. We felt we could grow the business, uh, gave it more critical mass, and it was good use of our cash. But that's not, I mean, it's a good business, but there's going to be more. We talk more about the biotech side of the business. We haven't talked really any about the clinical controls. Today. But it's the history of the company. It's the origin of the company. It's a good business. We want to retain it. So you just operate it differently. Um, when you think about just in 
your tenure there post nine years um, and the fact that you had talked about the um, dynamic duo management team and now we're I'm not sure we're dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, as it relates to now having a strategy that the two be controlled and kind of spread out and the growth of the business, what what are the challenges beyond just forming the management team, but beyond that in terms of execution and making sure with the global expansion and getting into other markets? Um, specifically, we were talking the other day just about um, making sure everyone's on the bus as you're going in this new direction. And uh, are there just specific things now internally you're paying attention to to make sure that all of your employee base beyond the management team understand what this new the new global strategy would be? Well, I think it's more than just understanding the strategy. I think, you know, to get buy-in on the strategies, you know, maybe there's debate and discussion, but you get to the end of this and you present it, and people are pretty bought in. Uh, I think the issues are more um, twofold, maybe one psychological, where people's talents are and where they are <coughs> with it. And then the other is, do you have the, uh, we call it intellectual skills, experience, capacity to deal with it. And uh, I don't mean to, I'm gonna use this as an illustration. We have a wonderful head of HR, but she's a manager level person, a wonderful person, but does she have the capacity? And she's never been asked to do this before. I mean, you know, she dealt with the people in Minneapolis and does a wonderful job of that, that a very defined, narrow role. Now we're asking her to be the head of a global business, and she doesn't have experience in China, in Europe, and she's being asked to do something that's completely different. The question is, and I'm using that merely as an example, not to pick on her, but you know, does she have the experience and the capacity to rise to that level or not? Because it's a very different, it's a very different job that we're asking her. You know, that's pretty challenging, and it's not her fault or not in her background. I mean, she was hired for one thing, and now all of a sudden she's being asked to do something mm -hmm. completely different. Mm -hmm. and so it's not the buying of the strategy. I mean, I think she's totally bought into the strategy, but does she have that capacity to, to mm -hmm. do that? And we did have that, you know, I talked about replacing the head of sales and marketing. He was a very internally focused guy. I mean, how can a sales leader not travel, for example, not be with customers? You know, so if you're asking somebody to be the global head of sales and marketing, we needed to replace that position for that reason, mm -hmm. because even though the old person uh, bought into the strategy, didn't have the capacity or the experience or the drive or whatever the intangibles are. So I think that's a much bigger issue, because mm -hmm. we're, we're taking people that were hired and operated in a certain um, element, if you will, and now we're being asked to do something completely different completely different pace. So you're talking a lot about basically trust. Um, how does, how do you kind of not convince or, you know, pitch your employees? How do you build that trust? Do you trust your uh, new HR person to fill this role in your sales department? How do you kind of gauge trust in this? Well, I think they're really two different questions, or I read them two different ways. I, I think management team always needs to have trust of the thousand employees we have. Um, I mean, we're really partners in it, and you know, we need to be close to them, we need to listen to them. And I mean, I've always come with the belief that we have different backgrounds and experiences, but no one's really more important than the other. I mean, our shipping clerks need to make sure they're just absolutely point blank after <coughs> shipping out or we have very good customer service in a way that's much more important than what I do every day or you know how the phone's answered, you know, do you get to the right person that's true with courtesy? I mean that's in some ways more important than what I do. But so it's not um, it takes everybody in a lot of different disciplines. And uh, I think to do that you've got to be available, you've got to be visible, you've got to have consistent actions. You, you've got to be aligned in how you operate. And you know, I think one of the beauties of this company historically has been that 
there's not been the haves and the have nots, and there's been a lot of trust as a result of that. And so does that change as you change this culture? And I think that's you know, part of what we have to be sensitive to in the talent re retention area. Uh, but that's how you build trust. I mean, because you're in it together, and you're transparent and visible, and that's how you build trust. But that's a very different question then. How do you make sure that people have the right capacity? You know, the, the, the question, do you trust, for example, the HR person to get this done? Um, you know, you've got to work with those people. You've got to listen to them, I, I think, to see where their struggles are, what they need help with. I mean, do you need to get a, do you need to get them a coach? Do you need to get them additional talent? Do you need to have consultants from the outside? I mean, how do you bolster that up? I mean, you've got to be real sensitive. So I think there are really two different levels of trust. I don't know if that was where your question was headed, but I'm, I'm interpreting the question. But to add a different twist to it, because you're doing these full-time transformative acquisitions and mergers, do you find a different degree of complexity when you're trying to convey this, I'm now, it's not the strategy of my smaller company, but now I'm part of this bigger company. What, are there additional or different types of challenges? Oh, I, I think that's a huge challenge because Somebody's built up a nice company. They want to keep doing it the way they were doing it. They don't want to, you know, they were, you know, we talked earlier about being tough in acquisitions, but they're smaller companies. They have more freedom, and now they're being asked to fall in the line in a corporate um, type of environment where there's certain disciplines. And there's a time you when you <coughs> financial results. There's certain HR practices that happen in the common cycle. You know, there's joint marketing. Your brand name maybe fits in differently. I mean, there's a whole lot of practical and psychological aspects, and that's that's really hard to do. I mean, we bought a, this small research group that I talked about in Boston. Um, you know, they were very entrepreneurial with a dynamic leader, and, and now it's really kind of a small research arm. It's not very big to the whole, and it's got a whole lot different level of prominence. And you know, we made a lot of money when we bought them, but you know, is that you know, so how does he fit in? I mean, that, that is really hard. It's, it's really hard. And, you know, that's where clear goals and expectations and all that need to be articulated, hopefully, during the, the acquisition process and during that assessment of is there a cultural fit and is there a bill to execute or not. You know, that's really got to be done in that phase. I think you know this started the strategy that we outlined started during the interim period, but really wasn't done until he got here. And what his background is, he's got a lot of experience in Asia and he's got a lot of merger and acquisition experience. So those aspects of the strategy are probably more as a result of his presence and his capability and his background. So the strategy framework we started developing was accelerated, and there's probably more emphasis on those two areas because of his background. And I think that was appealing to the board as they recruited him, because they believed that was a you know, vital part of the strategy. So, so for the most practical, and here we are, we're all strategists, we'll be strategists, and as they graduate and going out of the world, what do you, if you were to say, the most important things I have learned in my career around strategy that I will portably take with me, you know, if you go on to something else or in your community work as a leader, working on boards and things like that, what do you find is the most critical? Well, you know, I, I think the answer to that is a value proposition and understanding the markets. Um, you've got to have something of value in your delivery or you don't have a market. But then the market also has to want so you really have to understand who you're selling to, why you're selling it to them, why they're buying from you, you know, whether it be geographic or by product or by nature of their business. And it, it's really hard to get those answers. It's really hard to get those answers. And we deal with them daily and it's changing all the time and you don't understand them and you learn new things. Um, 
you know, you can probably work through hiring the right people and attracting the right talent and, you know, figuring out the right pricing. Those are strategic decisions. But you, you have, if you don't understand the market, you don't understand the value of the proposition. So as you go around visiting with companies that are meeting people, I would try to engage them. If you really want to learn about their business and really care about, you know, focus on those kind of questions because every executive worries about those things. I think the strategy would be the same. Uh, the pace and the risk we're taking might be different. We might take on even more risk if you're private, you know, if you really believe in the strategy. But you know, we've got an investor base, I said that's going from a very narrow risk reward scenario to a broader one, you, know, you can't go too far. Um, there's a lot of um, cost. I mean, just look at the, I look at the amount of time I've spent the last four weeks you know, traveling dealing with the investment community and the calls I've gotten even this morning, you know, from investors. I mean, it's just, it takes a lot of time. It's very expensive um, to be a public company. But on the other hand, every company is owned by somebody. So it's just a matter of how broad the investor base is and how you deal with it. But I, I think if we were private, there'd be some owner, and then you'd have to understand the risk reward tolerance of that owner of the private owners and how they differ from uh, the public owners. They just have different missions, different time frames. Well, it seems like there's quite a bit of fit um, to some things that we've been talking about so far. We still have to jump into innovation strategy. We'll also be focusing around global strategy and of course some of the things Greg talked about in terms of implementation. That's where we're going to be as we enter to the end of the term. So um, as I said, three good coming attractions. Tuesday we're going to jump into innovation strategy and we'll maybe use um, our work with Techni as kind of our base to continue to work on. So explore more of their website, delve into the products. Um, Take a look on Hoover's, get some more information, and leave that kind of as our context as we think about innovation. So, enjoy the weekend, and Greg will be around for a little bit more. But thank you so much.